I've just had a conversation with Mark Shaler, who I had met at the Good Life Festival and knew I liked him immediately. He's a thinker, he's a doer, a creator, a speaker, an author of two of the most utterly brilliant do books. And you might not immediately recognize Mark's name, but I promise you after this podcast, you're not going to forget him. Mark not only has immense knowledge of sustainability, he's had three decades in the industry, but what I loved is his deep understanding, empathy of the issues businesses face and how he can pull together the science and the arts and the vision along with business needs and issues and dreams and comes up with magical solutions. He's a true business visionary and he'll have you completely captivated. And it's one of those podcasts, you know, those podcasts that you have to have your notebook. This is one you're going to have to have your notebook. I scribbled about a hundred pages whilst recording him. I wanted to read the books he's read. I wanted to look at the speeches he had listened to. I wanted to Think in a Mark way because, my goodness, it was powerful. Absolutely powerful, magical and enjoyable. And I know you're going to love this one. Bow your head and let your eyelids close on down. Where we're going, you won't need to bring your frown. I'm Holly Tucker and welcome to Conversations of Inspiration. Back in 2006, I founded Not On The High Street for my kitchen table. And since then, I've gone on to launch Holly & Co. I'm the UK ambassador of creative small businesses. And I believe that having a business doing what you love is the key to a happy, fulfilled life. My dream is to help everybody start theirs. I'm here to offer advice, inspiration, wisdom and encouragement. And in my view, the best way to do this is by sharing stories. So I've reached out to my favourite small businesses, entrepreneurs and those who simply inspire me and ask them to share theirs. Here are my conversations of inspiration. Mark. Such a pleasure to see you again. I think the last time we met was at Charlie Gladstone's Good Life Festival and it was a glorious evening and it's a bit of a different day, isn't it? It's a bit gloomy, a bit rainy, but welcome to Conversations of Inspiration. Thank you. It's such a treat to be asked. Yeah, it's cloudy and grey, but do you know what? I think you determine your own weather and so it's sunny and in the 30s, that's centigrade here. <laughs> That's great. And I also love when researching you, the titles that make you up. So just to start with, we've got a charismatic keynote speaker, a leading change consultant for businesses big and small, co-founder of the bloody amazing Do Lectures, author of two of my favourite books, Do Disrupt and Do Present, and host of your own phenomenal podcast, Making Things Better and Making Better Things. I'd like to counter those brilliant titles by also saying that you're a self-proclaimed grumpy dad of four who loves indie music. I am, I am. (laughs) Sourdough bread, yoga, and you have a shit taste for shoes. And that just made me laugh. It was the shadow side of all the other titles. Totally. I do need to correct one thing. I'm not one of the co-founders of Do. I'm one of the founding partners. So Do was founded Ah. by David and Claire. And then there were four or five other people asked in to help buttress it in the early days. You're one of the godparents, are you, of it? Yeah, I'm like the nice uncle, I think <laughs> I am. So tell me about the proclaimed grumpy dad of four. Oh, you know what life's like, Holly. It can feel like a battle sometimes. And I'm old, I'm 54, and my eldest daughter is 28. I've had a lot of years of managing or shepherding, helping lift. And sometimes with that light, closer you get to the light, Holly, the bigger the shadow becomes. And so as I've moved Mm. closer to that, sometimes the grumpy bit gets bigger. And sometimes I just want to be on my own or with my wife on our own. We all got locked down together. So September, October 2019, my daughter and son-in-law and my granddaughter all moved back from London. My middle daughter stopped traveling around the globe and came home. My son moved back from university and my youngest daughter was still at home. So there were three of us and then there were 
However many is that is? Three, four, five, six, <laughs> Too seven, many. Eight, eight, nine of us. Then there were nine of us. And then their partners moved in. No one said anything. One day we just realized that Ella had been living with us for about a month. And we thought, oh, okay, that's happened then. And I guess in all of that, Holly, sometimes you lose who you are. And that can bring mm. some grumpiness or some impatience. Maybe that's a better word. Impatience. But the impatience, is it sort of, does the rough edges, obviously not during COVID, come off? Because I also know that you love your walks and nature, your animals, you're a big fan of wild swimming. And so did those things give you comfort during lockdown? I mean, I myself yeah. tried wild swimming. I didn't go all in because my sister wouldn't let me go all in. I started, I wanted to buy my own float, but I didn't. I rented it. I wanted to buy one of those big dry robes, but she wouldn't let me. And then on our eighth swim she said go on Holly we're now wild swimmers and then I got the notorious wild swimming bug that saw me definitely not wild swimming ever again let's just put it that way okay let's start at the beginning here I'm 54 <laughs> I've got all the middle-aged male vices right I drink kale I wild swim I make sourdough bread I ride my bike squeezed <laughs> into lycra and I carve spoons, right? I, I've got them all. I collect the set. It's like top trumps of that stuff. The wild swimming is really interesting. We used to just call that going on holiday in the 70s, Holly. That was just going on holiday. Yeah. But, but now it's got a name. And I've always loved a bit of open water. But what shifted me properly into this category was I, about four years ago, a friend of mine said, do you want to come to swimming lessons? And I did that offended face that went, I can already swim. I and mean, he went, yeah, but you told me that you swim like a boxer and you really want to swim like a swimmer. So I said, that's true. So I went along and I spoke to the coach, Dave, and I dived in and Dave said, swim a length. So I swam a length. And he said, what are you here for? And I said, because I swim like a boxer and I want to swim like a swimmer. And he said, okay, I've got one, <laughs> two, two tips for you. Number one, stop fighting the water. Number two, slow down to speed up. And four years later, it's my Monday night activity. I'm in the advanced class now. I'm in the elite class now for swimming. Elite, and I love it. I love it. Elite. I know. It's like proper scary. And then during lockdown, I'd been, I'd been eyeing up where I live. I live in a place, in near a place called Ashby de la Zouche in Leicestershire. It's the heart of the National Forest, which is old coal mining spread between Loughborough and Cannock, this huge swathe. And in a really weird world, some 22 years ago, I part funded the national forest when i was head of sustainability for asda and i've ended up living right in the heart of it and when we go for our morning walks which you're absolutely right we're a mental health godsend at the beginning of the lockdown i walked past this little lake and the dog swims there and I kept looking at it thinking well it's old coal mining i've no idea where how safe that is and then i jumped in two years ago and and i've not jumped out i'm still in it and i swim at highgate ponds when i'm in london i've got all of that going on and it's genuinely <laughs> I've never had the, I think I have got sick once swimming in the water, but I just put it down to once in two years that I'll take those odds. I'll take those odds. Yeah, no, you're totally right. And my gosh, it sounds like an idyllic situation that you're in. And we're going to get into your role and your loves. But I know you have a real appreciation for the simpler things in life. And I can hear that. Do you think that's helped crystallize your vision of the bigger picture? Yeah, totally. I think it's very easy as we grow, as we emerge from hip adolescent and boisterous teen into, in my case, university and then into work. It's really easy to think that by adding more layers to yourself, by becoming the layers of sand in an alum sands glass dome, <laughs> we become more. <laughs> so you, the stuff you own, the experiences that you do, the travels that we go on, all make you. And I think that is true to a degree. But there's a really great conversation around where's your age, letting go of those things, becoming nobody, giving those things away metaphorically, physically, emotionally. That's when we truly become ourselves. It was never in the acquisition. It was in the manner of mm. deacquisition that we truly find ourselves. And I'm at that turning point. I'm at peak stuff for me. I'm at peak experience. I'm at peak 
complexity. I don't want a complex life anymore. I'm tired. I want a really simple life. I want to get on the train and be really excited when I come to London. And I equally want to get on the train and be really relieved when I go back home to my chickens mm. and my garden and my swimming and my wife and the kids that we've still got two at home. No, we've got one at home, one at university. So she dips <laughs> in and out of home. And there's something I think really, there's that great Ram Dass film written by Jamie Cato, which is worth watching, which is called Becoming Nobody. And it is almost like the goal. It's the aim as you, as we move towards the inevitable end, that we become nobody and we're comfortable. And this is the magic that we're comfortable mm. with, with less and with just ourselves. I do think it's all about the timing, isn't it, mm. in your life and whether you have, have got to that point where you can let go. I think I talk a lot about chapters in your life and how many chapters we have. And if I think of myself and the amount I was accumulating, you know, let's say in your 30s, it's all about accumulation in your 30s in a way. It's the ladder, it's the family, it's the home, it's the cut, it's whatever it is. And you're totally right. The more you age, the more you're like, might have taken too much on completely in my entire life I need to let the sandbags go and sometimes you're married to them no I'm just joking you, you know the, the whole thing is that you it can become very heavy tell me about your vision for the bigger picture so you've just described almost releasing everything and becoming you know so that the baggage has gone in a way but does that now allow you time to think of that bigger picture and you know when you were a child you were told you weren't the creative one tell me about how that has manifested itself because we're going to go into your life but i'm wondering from that starting point how does that make you feel yeah it's a great question and and it, this is a particularly tricky thing to speak about because it was something my dad said to me with no malice I, and he won't remember it, right? But I remember it. Mm. I was having a drawing competition with a kid at school called Jason Wilborn, who was a really good drawer. I'm not a good drawer. I'm very competitive. And, uh, and he said to me, you're a crap drawer. He didn't use those words. We were about six. He said, you're not very good at drawing. I said, I am. And he said, no, you're not. I'm better than you. And I said, no, you're not. He was. So he said, we're going to have a uh, drawing competition tonight. We're going to both go and draw something. Stuart Jordan and Paul Baum, his friends, they would be the judges. It was already stacked against me, Holly. But I said, okay, <laughs> brilliant. What, what are we going to draw? And I'm thinking side on car, stick person, something simple. I was six. And, and he said, no, we're going to draw the Lone Ranger. No, there's no, there's no internet. There was no, I never book of the Lone Ranger. I draw from memory. And so basically I drew a stick man with a hat, right? That's, that was my Lone Ranger. And, and I'd forgotten to do it when I got home. So I remembered it about 6.30, just after my tea. And my dad came home from work. He's a photographer and um, very creative, bit of a genius in that world. And he looked over my shoulder. And I remember it really clearly. He did that closing down question that, that I think we all fall into the trap of saying, what's that supposed to be? And you're automatically mm. thinking, oh, obviously it's the Lone Ranger. And I said, oh, it's the Lone Ranger. I've <laughs> got a drawing competition with Jason Wilborn. And he went, oh, Jason Wilborn's really good at drawing. <laughs> I said, I know. <laughs> he said, I think it's probably important to realize that you're not the creative one. That was my brother's very good drawer. You're the physics-y, science-y, sporty one, which I am, absolutely. He, my brother, is also those things. And long and short, Jason Wilborn won the drawing competition, a packet of Monster Munch and the plaudits of, of, of the year. And I didn't draw again for nearly 20 years. Because I got mm. confused between creativity and all creativity is, and this is my definition, is imagining a world that hasn't arrived yet. I got confused between creativity and being able to articulate creativity with a pen and pencil, drawing. And I can't sing either, but it doesn't mm. mean that I'm, I can't write amazing lyrics, right? So yeah, it was a really interesting moment and there's no malice or awe from my father and there's definitely no irritation or blame from me. I hid my creativity really deeply because I didn't think I had any. And then when I started drawing again, when I had kids, I drew like a six-year-old, obviously, because I hadn't drawn for 20 years. But I've realized <laughs> that imagining a world that hasn't arrived yet, oh, I'm really good at that. That's true yeah. creativity. And I just don't express it in the same way that, in this case, Jason Wilborn did. And I never changed any of the names. So 
I hope he's listening and he was an amazing, and he probably is still <laughs> an amazing drawer. <laughs> And tell me, did the school recognise that? What was your experience in terms of creativity and the school recognising that you had a brain that was creative, not necessarily your hands drawing were creative? You must remember I'm old, right? So I was born in 1968. By the way, let's not say you're so old, right? You're 54. It's not ancient yet. It's not ancient, but education was incredibly different in the 1970s. Correct. Yes, that is. Now, I grew up in Leicestershire. And Leicestershire was incredibly advanced in education. It was playing with new models of education. It was with student-led, pupil-led education. So there was quite a lot of creativity and space to play. And I loved that. In the last two years, we were in one class. And we had this old school teacher. She was brilliant. It was very much reading, writing, and arithmetic, right? It was very much that way around. And so I don't think she recognized my creativity. But the godsend was a new head teacher called Mr. Stocker, who had come in, I think, 18 months from the end of my time at primary school. And he was incredible. So he did see this broader creative person that that I was. And I seem to now know I've got ADHD. I didn't know that then. I just thought I was naughty or unable to focus. And yeah, Mm -hmm. that was recognized. And I took the school out on strike, Holly. I took the entire... (laughs) school out on strike over the quality of school dinners they were too good i didn't want vitamins minerals and vegetables in my school dinner i wanted the kind of rubbish that we were eating in society as a whole you know the the, the flushing through of convenience food was an amazing thing in terms of freeing women from the chores of looking after kids it was incredible and convenience food added so much to our lives but it also took quite a lot away as well And I wanted to be able to bring sandwiches into school so I could not have properly cooked food and took the school out on strike. I think it started off with four of us, me leading. I I made little placards down with dinners. We want sandwiches. Yeah. And um, and after about... It's bad, isn't it? And and after about an hour of this, I had 60 kids with me and the whole school within another... And we were being told to come in and I just refused. And then in the end, the headmaster came out and he went, I hear you. You can now bring sandwiches if you wish instead of dinners. And can we all please return to school? And, and that's brilliant. Other you won. Yeah, Rage against was, the machine there. Fun, fundamentally, Holly, I lost because my mum rightly said, <laughs> the thing is, Mark, you sometimes have sandwiches for tea when we're late home. So you're going to have a hot dinner every day and it's going to be at school. So fundamentally, I did not win. But and it was a lesson. It was a lesson in responsibility because the only nice dinner lady that ever lived, a woman called Mrs. Thomas, she knew it was my fault. And on day one of the new regime, Holly, I'm at the front of the queue with my tray. I'm looking at the nice dinner lady, Mrs. Thomas. And she said, hey, Mark, I'm glad you're still with us. She knew it was my fault. Everyone apart from mum, it was my fault. And I went, yes, Mrs. Thomas. And she said, do you know what would happen, Mark, if everybody had sandwiches? I said, no, Mrs. Thomas. She says, I wouldn't have a job, Mark. And she was right. Within three years, there were no dinner ladies at that school. There were just lunchtime supervisors. And that was my first realization that with power comes great responsibility. Tell me about what your viewpoint is when you decided to dull down your creativity and concentrate on other things going through schooling. But now you come out and we're going to talk more about your career. But I'm wondering if you have experienced this just as a general point that from your experience that you see the dulling down of creativity in schools that then obviously leads to the dulling down in creativity in businesses, that we're told it's to be a certain way, that the colouring outside the lines is not valued. And what's your take on that? We have removed creativity and art from schooling because it's really hard to measure. Schooling has become the easiest way to measure progress, and that's to do with tests, SATs, that's to do with assessment. And we've confused that with actually learning something. And we've confused that with learning how to be entrepreneurial. Now, I love science. Don't get me wrong, I did an environmental science degree. It's absolutely incredible. I did all the human options. I never could decide, Holly. What, my A-levels were a shit show. I did English. I did general studies, which I loved. I did physics and I did geography. I took a humanity and art and a science because I couldn't decide. Yep. And my degree was in environmental science and geography because I couldn't decide. And at some point, we've put those two things against each other. We've said art and science are different and they've got different parts of the brain and 
you're either one or the other. No, no, not at all. Leonardo da Vinci was an amazing artist, an incredible sculptor, and an audacious scientist. No one ever said mm. they're separate. And we've pulled them apart and we get our kids, our young people to choose which way to go. Then we remove funding for the arts. Then we remove funding for play. There's a beautiful podcast between Alexi Sale and the comedian Stuart Lee. And Stuart Lee talked about all of the conditions that existed in the late 80s that allowed a young man with no money to go to university based on merit. I think he went to Oxford to leave university and to spend three years messing about, working out an act, getting to put shows on for cheap in a town where the people that came to see him could afford to live there. And all of the conditions mm. that created that opportunity have been removed, not least the focus on non-art-based courses. And I saw this firsthand. I was up in Bradford, which is my old university town. We had a 30-year reunion last year. And uh, so we all went up and we got a tour around the university and it was amazing. I learned loads about the history of the place, even though I went to university there. And they've dropped their numbers from 12,000 to 6,000. They've dropped the number of people who were from outside of Bradford coming to university. That used to be, at, I think, 90%. That's now 30%, 70% are from Bradford. And they've removed all of the arts and creativity courses and they've gone solely down science, technology and business routes. Forgetting, of course, and you know this, Holly, the three most in-demand skills in business are creativity, emotional intelligence, mm. and problem solving. All three of which ride mm. through the center of art like the word Blackpool through a stick of rock. We've done ourselves such disservice in the way that we educate our young people. It will come back round. I want to go back to your story because you mentioned your degree and it was in environmental science. And now this was long before issues surrounding sustainability and climate change were the words on everyone's lips. Yeah. What led you to that degree of choice at the time? You were a Greenpeace member, weren't you, since the age of nine? Yeah, nine, maybe even eight. I can't remember. I joined Greenpeace because I wanted to do a project on something unusual at school. But that said, you should look at Greenpeace and the whale. They sound like a band, right? So I'm like, oh, yeah, that sounds ace, <laughs> Dad. Yeah. But the whole story of Greenpeace's origination is amazing. As these hippies all met to try and change the world, as they left, someone said, yes, peace out or peace. And the other one said, yeah, and let's hope it's a green peace. That's how the name came about. It's a wonderful story. I read a little bit about how, you know, only when the last river is dry or the last animal has been eaten, will we realize that we can't make a profit out of nature. Words to that effect. And I thought, yeah, I get that. And I was, yeah, nine. So I got it. And, and got really actively involved in it. But the reason I did environmental science is two reasons, really. I failed my A-levels. So I was going to go and do law. I should have started in 87. And I'd been messing about and having too much fun with my mates. And I had this choice. I, I had enough to get into. I could have gone to Brighton Poly to do economics and geography. I had a C and an E. Or I could stay and put it right. And I decided that my life would be better if I stayed and put it right. I mean, number one, being in Brighton in 1987, it was the, it was the beginnings of Chicago House in yeah. the UK. It would, have been, it would have been incredible, right? But I think it may have led me astray. <laughs> I'm wondering. So I decided to hang around, <laughs> retake everything. And I, I realized that I wasn't, I was the kind of person that really wanted to go north, not south. I loved the south, but I thought, no, I'm going to go, I'm going to go north. I don't know it. And a friend of mine was doing environmental science at Bradford and I went to see him and he loved the course and he loved the city. And I thought, yeah, I'm up for this. And then the final straw, I was with a girl at the time and it was quite clearly the end of that relationship. And we would got all the same universities. And I thought, I need a contingency in case we go to different... In I case need... this doesn't work out. Yeah, and it didn't work out. And best thing for both of us. So I put Bradford down as one that she didn't want to go to. And it happened to be the highest of the grades that I needed. So when I did pass my A-levels the second time around, or properly pass them, it was my first choice and she went somewhere else. And I arrived in, in this city to do a subject that I loved. It's physics, it's geography, and it's artistic. Because I was looking at how you design mm. cityscapes, how you design tower blocks and high-density living so that people feel safe, not ostracized. I was really interested in the environmental determinism as a, as a building mechanism for urban society. 
So I got into the philosophy of it. And it wasn't the best university town, I don't think. I think Leeds was way cooler and Manchester definitely cooler. But I learned there's a lesson here, Holly. When you arrive in a town and you want to walk around looking cool, like something at a Lloyd Cole and the commotions and everybody singing Katrina and the waves, you just got to go, okay, that's shit. I'm going to go make my own call. So there was enough of us. We created a club, two clubs, a little scene of our own. And it was great because I had to learn how to DJ. I had to learn how to make posters. I had to learn how to promote stuff. Do you know what, Holly? To go back to your very first point, that's probably what brought my creativity back out, was back. the desperation to yeah. find people like me. To find your people. Yeah. And and your world is just these stepping stones, isn't it? Because you graduated with, with this degree, but you realise pretty quickly that you were interested in, as you said, the way people use products or services, that was what was capturing your imagination. And you took a role with local authority as a sustainability manager for small businesses, looking at factories and products. And I can imagine that was completely fascinating. Are yeah. there examples that you remember from that time that it was a hard sell to persuade people then? Or were they open to change and innovation? Because this is now what you do as your bread and butter. But at that time, this is a long time ago. Yeah, it was great. If you can sell sustainability just after the 1991 recession, which was a deep and <laughs> most importantly, a very long recession that yeah. had a long tail. That yes. Wanted. If you can sell sustainability to business people in Bradford, nothing wrong with Bradford, but it's very difficult in economic in environment itself within a bigger economic challenge. If you can sell sustainability there, you can sell it anywhere. And I loved it. And it spoke so strongly to my ADHD because I, I get bored really quickly. I was seeing three different businesses a week, 150 businesses a year, and digging really deeply into what they made. But most people, there's a point where you're close enough to each other to reach out. And that could be, for example, chatting to one guy about his effluent emissions, which were going straight into the river air and saying that we really probably need to put them through at least a settling tank or a deacidification process. And he was like, yeah, I suppose so. I said, I noticed behind you, you got a picture of you fishing. Yeah, yeah, I love fishing. Brilliant. You do know, don't you, that we can get trout back in the river if we can not keep it quite as acidic as it is. And I was always able to find a bridge to what they believed in wow. and what I believed in. And that's about observation. The picture was behind him. I was really good at working out how to make them feel more. So the science bit kicks in and I'm walking around the factory and I'm the kind of person that just said, what? You've got a wool scouring plan here. You're bringing raw wool in. You've got lanolin and a whole load of permethrin and difficult stuff on there. You've got to get it off. So you put it through the scouring process. Six different baths at different temperatures. Not one of them has got a lid on them and they're all heated. Why? Why is that? Oh, good point. It is a good point. Yeah. Why should we do that? Or I was looking at a, a company that made fruit games and the front of a fruit machine, as you lift it up to change the mechanisms... The front of it's held up with two gas struts, the sort of thing that holds your bonnet up on your car. Yeah. I'm looking at one that was up and being worked on. And I said, so what's wrong with that one? And he said, um, the guy said, it needs two gas struts to hold it up. And so we just propped it up at the moment on one and, and he's putting the second one on. I went, okay, but it's being held up on one. Yeah, it's being held up on one, but you need two <laughs> to make it hold up. Yeah, we need two, but it's being held up on one. Yeah, it's being held up on one. Should we take the other one out permanently? Seven pound a unit saving. And, and it was simple stuff like that. So I've just written these words from a new book, actually. And when I first started out, the questions I would get asked was, Mark, can you keep me out of prison? And then it was, Mark, can you please keep me out of the papers? Mark, can you please keep me leaner? Can you make me more efficient? Mark, can you make my brand worth more than my assets, which is where, where we are right now? Yeah, I can do that for you. Mark, can you help me attract and retain better teams, better customers and better uh, employees? Yeah, I can. And that is, Mark, can you help me be more relevant to Gen Z? Yeah, all of those things, the answer is the same. Should we yeah. look at sustainability? Well, the question's really different and it's just changed over time. 
Every week, I hand this part of the podcast over to our brilliant partners at Dell Technologies. We've covered a number of topics through our business pharmacies around imposter syndrome in women. And I think the two main factors which come up time and time again are money and technology. Dell really understand this, and so it's why they have tech advisors on hand, real humans who can speak to you about your own business and who will help advise on everything from hardware products that will work best for your business needs, what cloud-based software might be good for you, and even ensuring your cybersecurity is just all set up. Having spoken to some of the tech advisors myself, I can vouch that they really do know their stuff and they're eager to help you. No question is too silly, I promise. It's also a free service and there is no obligation to purchase. To find out more information, head over to dell.co.uk slash smallbiz, spelt with a Z. And before you go, don't forget to head on over to holly.co forward slash dell to enter our Tech in a Box competition, where we have partnered with Dell Technologies and Intel to give six lucky winners the opportunity to win a brand new Dell XPS 13 laptop and a whole host of small business goodies to help your business thrive, worth over a £1,000. So what are you waiting for? Go and enter. Now back to our conversation of inspiration. You mentioned the ADHD. Do you feel when we're in a time where we're understanding neurodiversity more and more as a dyslexic myself and I talk about, you know, that sounds like a Pinterest quote, but I do believe it. It's a superpower. I certainly believe it has been for me in the sense that I believe that it has worked muscles, rewired my brain. So I think uniquely that there is no such thing as a problem for me. It's just what am I going to do to solve it? I just don't see obstacles because really when you just get to reading and writing, if you've had to overcome those obstacles, which are faced with you every single day, you sort of can overcome anything. Tell me about the man and the trout and the picture behind him. Do you feel that that was your superpower yourself that has given you this ability to create those connections? There's almost a rush to collect the different neurodiversity badges at the moment. I'm not going to criticize that. I think it's brilliant. It adds a massive amount of understanding for how my life has worked out in my strengths. And I've got four kids, all four have got dyslexia. One's got dyspraxia. I've got my wife who's dyslexic as well. They've all had to find different ways to solve problems. One of my daughters, the educational psychologist, said, I can't believe that she can read. Her coping strategies are so strong that she's been able to teach herself. Her dyslexia is so severe. And that's amazing. And so back to that little office in Bradford, The first thing that pops up is the fact that I couldn't keep still. My eyes, I'm looking around, I'm looking around, I'm searching for something in that room. My attention is split in a million different ways, like fractals for a kaleidoscope. And I'm thinking, oh, hello, it's Fisherman. Right, brilliant. Oh, what's that over there? Oh, he likes Rolls Royce. He's got a Rolls Royce ashtray. He smokes. Lemonade. Didn't people think people smoked it? All of this is noise is constant in my head. But the bit that stuck out was, I can use the fish. This is where I need to go. So not being able to decide what I want to do when I grow up, not being able to pick a single subject, but wanting to do them all. That's part of ADHD, of my Mm. experience of ADHD. And you bet it's a superpower. It's amazing. Nick finds it incredible. I can sit having a conversation or an interview online with someone from a podcast or for one of the reasons to be cheerful events. And I can be looking on my phone, researching something at the same time for not, not researching something outside of the conversation, inside of the conversation and still hear every word. I've just got that ability to multi-focus. Yeah. I can't imagine what life's like without the noise, but I can't imagine what life's like without being able to go straight into one channel of noise and just mind that. Has that answered your question? I think yes. It it has. It, it totally has. You were ahead of your time, obviously, when you were <clears throat> looking at sustainability as a the word that it is today, but you did it many years ago. You now run an innovation and environmental consultancy called APE, and you work with businesses, both big and small. You've worked with likes of Coca-Cola, Nike, John Lewis, along with the Tea Pigs and Dorset Cereals, just to name a few. And I love this. You say you help 
big companies think like small ones and small companies think like big ones. Tell me about this thinking and what led you to think this passion is now going to be my future? It's a great question because I'm not a big company person. My time in a big company was limited to about 14 months. I was head of sustainability for Asda. I say head of sustainability, there was just me. I was environmental manager, but I'm having head of sustainability because there was just me. And I don't fit that model well. I've spent 14 months, I didn't see my children awake apart from a weekend's brutal culture, horrible at the time. Probably very different now. I, I was surrounded by people who had all of the passion and enthusiasm squeezed out of them. And I thought, this isn't good. I'm going to leave, but I'm going to remember this. And then I lecture at university, mm. I lecture at Loughborough University, and I see these amazing, creative, phenomenal young people with great ideas and kooky piercings. And I see them cut their hair and shoehorn themselves into suits. And then I see the Unilevers and the Cokes and the other big businesses come in the other way looking for the kooky kids, and they can't see them because they've all tried to look like the bigger businesses. <laughs> all of these things, and the fact that I like, I, do, I build startups inside larger organizations. And I'm, it never ceases to amaze me how many amazing people there are that can be freed by a little program, a six-week accelerator that we run internally. I, I, I just constantly amazed at the talent that's been hiding in plain sight. So if I can help those larger organizations be braver with their product development and faster with their testing, that's amazing. So that's helping big companies mm. think like small ones. And then if I can help the small companies who have got something incredible and something like a product or a service that is just next level, if I can help lift their aspirations above being small, and for some of them, they only want to stay small and that's amazing. I'm never going to try and inject ambition where there isn't any. That's absolutely fine. If I can help them, then I can scale good. So if I can scale good, then I can maybe change a bigger market. I mean, some of my clients, other people don't like very much. I defend that massively. They're full of amazing people who genuinely want to make the world a better place. They've just got to do it slowly. Some of them too slow and it's frustrating. Some of them amazingly well. And I love this idea of transplanting a bit of startup into big business and then a little bit of big business ambition into startup. And that's, I've been quite successful at doing that. Good. I love it. You're, You're planting these seeds for them to cultivate and grow. I mean, you've saved clients in excess of 120 million per year through environmental improvements, or you've increased sales of products by 8,000% by introducing circular economy business models, or you've trained over 2,000 people in sustainability. These are big numbers and big changes. If a small business was listening today who might not be able to get the services of your business ape, tell me what advice you might share for them around innovation and that thought. Because in my experience, Mark, that's been the one thing. It's the eternal search for a silver bullet as a small business. and But then you get stuck. You get stuck into what works. And then you yeah. get scared about changing what works because potentially your mortgage is resting on it or your rent or whatever it is. You're a small business. A lot rides on your decisions. And innovation always gets put to the bottom of the list So I'm wondering, how do you put it to the top of the list? Or do you advise that? Yeah, no, it's fascinating. It used to be built in. Those smaller businesses, everything was innovation. They were permanently questioning what was happening. They normally had something to fight against, right? They normally had the big business occupier in that sector to fight against. We're the antidote to. Normally that was something there. So innovation became normal and bubbly. And then you hear about six years and you grow a little bit tired and then you've been quite successful. And you see, actually, it's interesting, back to Greenpeace, you saw this with Greenpeace. When Greenpeace were really young and had no assets and no reserves and nothing to lose, that's when they were the bravest and did their best work. Suddenly you've got shitloads of people who've a member and some of those people are older and maybe a bit risk averse in their attitudes. And consequently, you begin to make less brave decisions. So you see it outside of business as well. But it's essentially, that's what it is. You make less brave decisions because you fear losing what you've spent years building. So what I try and do is inject some more hunger. There's a really great German word, Einstellung, and it can mean more than one thing. But one of the definitions is 
not letting the success of yesterday get in the way of today. So just because you did it like that and it worked yesterday, it doesn't mean you've got to do it the same way today, but it may still work. But if we're not careful, we end up getting into this circle, this ever-decreasing circle. It's nearly as successful as last time. And then before you know it, you're, you're selling out to someone who really doesn't share the same ambition. I'll tell you who did this. There's a mm. brilliant, brilliant coffee bar called Tap in London, a range of them. And they sold out to a bigger chain of coffee bars. And, all the, and Camden Food Company, exactly the same thing. They just devalued the product to the point that it's the same as you can get anywhere else. Now, we talk about a creator myth. We talk about the personality of the originator. I hate the word founder, but the person that started the business. As you sell a business, that becomes diluted and you want an earn out. And I don't blame anyone for taking the money. But what's left can sometimes feel really hollow. When it's done well, the half-life, I love physics. I've told you already. Yeah, I, lo I love this conversation. The half-life of the passion of the creator is embedded within the culture of the organization. And some people do this really well. Ben and Jerry's brilliant. Body Shop, brilliant. It still feels like Ben and Jerry, mm. and it still feels like Anita. And there's some amazing stuff that can happen. Often it gets turned into more units, more numbers, more reporting, less risk. And that's when we lose a, like a whole crux in, in Harry Potter. We lose a little bit of ourselves or a little bit of our organization. But I, what I can't mm. do is criticize anyone that's had enough and wants the money. Right? I get it. You've done what you've done, your job. Mm. It's who you sell it to that matters, I think. And that's yeah. a tough ask. And sometimes anybody. founders don't find themselves with any choice, though, Mark, as well. True. Sometimes they've found themselves in situations where there's no choice. And have you, it's a, that's a whole heap of interesting conversation just there. I'm just wondering, tell me about when you advise small businesses and we were just talking about they make less brave decisions. And so would that be the advice that you would give to small businesses? You'd give the advice that basically we need to go back to I, I use the word founder a lot. Founder Titus, I call it. You know, it's this thing that we have when you start and you get comfy. And the whole point is to stay uncomfortable. Don't get comfy. Don't sit in the comfortable seat. Keep being uncomfortable because that means that you are exploring things and you're moving things forward. So would that be your advice for small businesses to continue to be brave? To be brave and to follow their gut instinct. Numbers really matter. You're not a, if you're not making a profit, you're not a business, right? It's fundamental. You mm -hmm. have to make a profit. But to be more concerned by third quarter sales figures over fourth quarter ideation or fourth quarter articulation is foolish. You, you've got to have someone else can look after the numbers. As somebody who mm -hmm. founded the business or as the person that created the business, your eyes need to be ab above the horizon. You didn't start this because you were good at numbers. Let somebody else do some of that stuff. You keep doing the thing that you're good at. That way, there's a hunger and a curiosity that remains. But I stand by what I say. If you're not making money, you're not a business. You have to cover the profitability stuff as well. I think you quoted my figures, 120 million. It's 160 million now that I've saved, generated wow. through per year through sustainability. If sustainability is costing you money, then you're doing it wrong. And there are some capital costs that are a bit more complex, but I genuinely think that curiosity, that striving for better and to play football where the ball is going to be rather than where the ball is the, ma is the magic. Mm. But you, what you said was right. You know, yeah. sometimes people, when they sell, they have no choice. They sell to the person that they've been talking to and I'm never going to criticize anyone for exiting. It makes sense. It's the only way that you can get your money back off. Yeah, no, absolutely. Tell me when you were working, looking at towns and thinking about towns at university and you were looking at the way people live and then you consult now with organisations who might have physical presence on the high street and things like that. Are you interested in where that sort of mix of your past and learning and future and how you're fascinated with companies and sustainability and and what that looks like for our retail landscape you know what we think of physical retail today and what we see of our future of our high streets because at the moment I'm I don't know if I'm right or wrong I don't spend enough time delving into all of this but I feel like there's an opportunity and I feel like we're in between the dinosaurs sort of dying off 
and the independence, being online, loving online. But now there's this turn where they're looking to that physical presence, uh, have another sort of dimension to their companies that I feel like, could this be the dawning of a new era? I don't know. What's your point of view on the high street? Well, this is definitely the start of something new. The high street is in a mess. People don't want to leave their home often to get the things that they need. Yeah. And yet they will use shopping as a leisure activity, almost as an antidepressant. And I understand yeah. the participation benefits of that. So what does that mean? We've got banks leaving the high street faster than you can shake a stick. You've got estate agents moving in, but we're about to see a big house price drop. So maybe some of those will, will disappear. Yeah. You've got all this incredible space. What can we do with it? And i tell you who did this beautifully. Gary V talked about this beautifully with regards to Toys R Us. He talked about two things with Toys R Us. Number one, Toys R Us subcontracted their distribution and their fulfillment to Amazon. Foolish, because then everyone's going to Amazon, not to Toys R Us. Foolish. Number two, <laughs> if Toys R Us became the place to go and play, play and creativity yes. is the center of business as much as it is the center of the childhood. If you could go and learn how to make Play-Doh there, right? Okay, it might be cutting your throat in terms of not selling Play-Doh, but you'll sell more ingredients for making Play-Doh. If you could find a reason to go in and play, then you'll spend money. So I've worked with some big high street names on retail over the last two years. And the word that runs through all of that work is community. Can we create something where others want to sit with you, want to be with you, not just to buy my stuff? Amazing. You've got to make a profit, otherwise you're not a business. But come in and learn. Come in and grow. This is beyond retailtainment. This is creating a place where people want to be. Oh, and by the way, we also sell mm. jumpers, slacks, whatever it might be that is also available there. Great coffee, all of that. But you have to have a reason to go in. Now, if we expand that thought a little bit, and you can see that with retail. I've got loads of ideas for that and retail. But if you expand that thought to those places that are really devastating the high street, the banks, they're just disappearing. Think about what you could do. Right, think just pick any of the banks. I don't mind, but we'll just pick Barclays because they're just the I can see the blue in my mind. But you pick Barclays yeah. or a bank. A bank is all about creating and maintaining a healthy relationship with money. It should be, right? That's what a bank should do. Yes. If you think about the way we manage money and you look at the space that's in a bank and you say, Do you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna develop some startup hubs sponsored, i.e., they give the space over. We put a few of the bank managers into entrepreneurial mode because they always wanted to be. They've only ended up being a bank manager because they couldn't hack it with their own business, right? So you create yeah. this amazing <laughs> learning space where people can come in and there's a personal finance bit. And obviously you don't need to bank with Barclays to be there, but the chances are you will if you've learned something from them. And then you create these incredibly well-connected, super high-speed connections, video booths, podcast booths, and you just say, yeah, use them. Use them. We're over here if you want banking mm. advice. If you can create a little hub and you partner with a Samsung and they provide all the tech, because yeah. if you're using, if you grow up creating on Samsung tech, you'll want to use Samsung tech when you get into business. You could just see this whole different, vibrant community emerging out of a redundant building that, that all, always felt like deposit, withdrawal, deposit, withdrawal. No, yeah. no, this is where we come up with new ideas. Just Imagine what it could be. I live in Ashby, right next to Ashby de la Zouche, and it's a little market town, and its high street needs some love. And most people would say, what we really need is an H&M. No, that's not what, I'm not knocking them. <laughs> They're amazing business, but that's not what Ashby needs. It would literally put every other clothing business out of business, right? So let's think about what each city, each town needs, and let's bring markets back, and let's make it cheap. There's a space in Ashby, the market space in Ashby, if I wanted to rent a store on the market, the internal market, um, I can't remember what the prices are. It's something in the region of £700 a month just to rent the space. £700 a month before I've paid anyone, made any profit. Mm. That is, I can, get a, I can get a shop cheaper than that. How do we create a bridge? How do we create a holding hand for people to move from an idea into maybe a retail business, maybe a food business, doesn't matter to me. And how does that then bring more life back into a town so that the town can breathe and grow? Because if, the, if we don't do it, 
they'll shrink and die. And that is, that's heartbreaking. And this is why I always come off these podcasts, Mark, and I say to myself, why aren't we listening to Mark's words? Because if you think about what you're actually describing, we, as you said, we're using our homes more and more. They're becoming sort of our churches. We don't tend to leave them. And what if our communities and our towns die? And we're all talking about it. And then one day they will be dead and it will be too late. Their properties will be all sold out to be residential properties, et cetera, et cetera. And in my own town, when I was in transitioning between not on the high street and Holly and Co, I needed to keep busy. So I helped my town out and I became the chair of the town and the committee. And we did, tried to do lots of wonderful things, events and all of these things. And I almost called myself the cheerleader of my local town. And then the next town asked me if I could come and maybe talk about their town and maybe the next town, could I come and do this for this town? And I was like, are you kidding me? This is, it's more than a full-time job, guys. But I did try to say, who could be the cheerleader of your town? Someone who's committed just for good to getting the right people into all of the open spaces, getting the right people into the shop fronts, becoming the sort of middle person, connecting, oh, we need a baker's, we'd love to have this community effort, we'd love this charity to be supported. And could we have these cheerleaders of each town that basically brought people together to innovate and move our spaces on? And then something happened and the bins weren't emptied or whatever and I couldn't cope and I had to go. <laughs> I'm, I'm making that all up. But basically sure. the town mentality got too much because I just didn't understand why no one wanted innovation. And actually I did this for free. And actually it was all out of the goodness of my heart. But that's what you want these committed individual citizens. I don't know what they are to take hold of their local areas because if we wait for government, we wait for our local councils and we wait for anything, it's not going to happen. But my fear is it, it's going to turn before our very eyes without anyone lifting a finger. It's a bit like the PTA, isn't it? When no one wants to put their hand up. No one wants to be the head of the PTA for that year. But actually then they'll moan like hell when nothing gets done and that things aren't happening. Who do we rely on to do this? Well, we, we can't rely on government. No disrespect to any government, but they're using knowledge from a long time ago to apply to a future that has not been invented yet. We, we need to look tangentially. We need to look at those areas that have boomed, those areas that have done really well. And say, so what were the magic ingredients here? And we need the Susans and we need the Altafs to get involved. And we need yeah. to be able to grow from the bottom up rather than from the top down. A new shopping centre will not solve your problems amazing local mm. entrepreneurs selling products that people want and need and that are planet less damaging. That's what's going to save your town. Making it fun to come into town so for more than one reason. Yes. That's the magic. And then if we can build that into, rather than have travel agents and who are great and solicitors who are amazing, but rather than have retail space full up of that, Let's make space for these incredible local artists. Let's make space for this yes. person that's making bread on a Saturday and giving it away to their mates or the salt would be source entrepreneur. Let's make space, create a hub for these people. Let's allow them to lift mm. off and charge them next to no rent because that's the only way that we're going to get the town centers back. It always creates a problem in terms of income and in terms of yield. I, I appreciate that. But that I would rather see taxation spent doing that than taxation spent in a million other ways that it's currently spent. Yeah, Pla Placing personality at the heart of entrepreneurship, placing purpose at the heart of entrepreneurship, making sure each town looks different. Do you remember when you could tell what town you were in just from yes, walking around rather yes. than it being... Clone towns versus hometowns. There you go. I grew up near Leicester. So I used to walk around Leicester. It was quite clearly Leicester. Silver Arcade had great shops in there. You had Gosh in there. You had the wardrobe in there. It was quite clearly Leicester. Down the road, you've got Limey's, quite clearly Leicester. If I go to the High Cross Centre now, could be in Amsterdam, could be yeah. anywhere. We've lost diversity in every possible way, and we've lost the feeling and the texture, the velvety texture of place. And I think we need to work mm. on how we bring that back. So I see huge positivity for towns and cities, but we're never going to solve it by looking at the things that solved it in the past, which was a new shopping centre, mm. which was knocking stuff down but keeping mm. the facades and putting an Apple store in. Amazing, great, but that is not the answer. It's no. part of the mix. 
And it's your brain that it's your brain and people listening right now to Mark's brain. If you take inspiration from it and you are one of those people, go and do something about it. That's just what I would just want to ask everybody. Go and do something about it. Don't go and wait for someone else. Go and do something. And Mark, you did go and do something else that's also, again, a bit different, which I just absolutely love and why you're on this podcast, because I think you're an amazing inspiration for us all is the work you do for good for nothing it labels itself as a community of thinkers doers makers and the best bit of this tinkers and yeah it's a wonderful project and i'm really lucky to be involved with zali leeds and manchester i I help run those two but i live in leicester go figure but good for nothing (laughs) pulls together maybe 30 or 40 designers design thinkers makers in a town and said friday night come in we've got a weekend worth of doing great stuff for three charities we then get three charities to come in and pitch their problems Um, i'm an outdoor barons charity and i can't get into some diverse quarters of the city how do i do that or i'm a food waste charity and i've got no no app or i'm a charity working with old people and i want a way of connecting them to young people so we can share stories so the, each of the charities will pitch to the 30 or 40 thinkers in the room that's a friday night we'll get a beer sponsor i think toast have sponsored us a lot actually they're amazing so we get this kind of great this is what we're trying to do evening and then you choose a team and you come back saturday morning and a third of the people roughly have gone into one team and a third of the people have gone into another team and then they, we spend the next two days developing whatever we can do, design, it might be brand, it might be web, it, it might be market research, and everyone works for nothing for the whole weekend. So you're doing good for nothing. And the charities or the causes leave with you know, a significant shift in, in enthusiasm. And it works so well. You know, we live in a time where we want to give, we want to give back, but what can I do? You know, I'm only a designer. Well, here you go. Let's design yeah. something exciting over the weekend. So we're trying to find those creative minds and find them an outlet for giving and growing projects that really need them. And it's yeah. worked really well. So they're all over the UK. And so if someone wants to do this, Mark, can they just look it up? Good for nothing. Exactly that. Yeah. There's a website, which I can't remember what it is, but I'll put it in the show notes or they can message me and I'll put them in touch with the mothership and the mothership will put them in touch with their local place. One of the biggest lessons I have learned from recording over 170 episodes of this wonderful podcast with incredible humans and founders is that ultimately to succeed, you have to innovate. The moment you stop innovating is the moment your brand ceases to be relevant to your market. As a brand that's grown and thrived over its 136 year history, innovation has been fundamental to the success of Avon. Avon have over a thousand patents and are responsible for many skincare firsts. From being the first brand to stabilise vitamin C in skincare back in the 90s, to bringing AHAs to the mass market, to most recently creating groundbreaking Protonol, an award-winning ingredient patented by Avon and found in their renewal power serum, which as a skin fanatic, I can genuinely vouch, has made a visible difference to my skin. It is this loyalty to cutting-edge beauty and innovative skincare, coupled with their continued commitment to accessibility and affordability for all, all whilst empowering their reps to build businesses and also pumping millions of dollars into female-focused causes across the globe that just truly set Avon apart. If you'd like to learn more about Avon or doing beauty your own way by building your very own business as an Avon rep, whether that's selling online or face-to-face, head over to holly.co forward slash Avon. Now back to our conversations of inspiration. I want to, before you go though, touch on this book that you alluded to. 
you, it's going to be released this summer called You Can't Make Money from a Dead Planet. And it explores how doing good in business is no longer a nice to have, but a necessity. And I very much know that. I'm proud that Holly & Co has become a B Corp. And I'm going to take that very seriously. But I'm going to move this into every single ounce of Holly & Co and every single thing that we do, where we're looking after our planet, our people and those that support us. Tell me about the biggest challenges businesses have today and tomorrow are facing. So I'm a firm believer in the power of business for good. Whilst business has created many of the world's problems, if not all of the world's problems, I think it's the only thing that can fix them. I think being able to ask a better question of business will give us significantly better future, imagining a world that hasn't arrived yet. So you think that business is more powerful than government? in solving our problems of the future? Undoubtedly. More powerful, more financially robust, and more trusted. If you look at the Edelman barometer mm -hmm. of trust, every two years, I think it comes out, government is trusted less than business. This is amazing. I'm not saying that's good. You've got this huge opportunity for business to reorientate itself towards a golden light, towards a better age. And if we can expand what a business's responsibilities are to the shareholders, which are just financial at the moment, there's legal responsibilities around not polluting and not taking health and safety lightly, all those things. But if we can have a responsibility that is triple bottom line based, social, environmental and economic, then that will reorientate business as a problem solver rather than just a problem creator. And if you can't afford me, and I'm not that expensive, it's really straightforward. And you don't don't wait to be a B Corp to do good, right? That's yeah. the start of the journey, but you can do it without that. It's amazing, but you can do it without that. Really simply, look at the environmental impacts and the social impacts that you have, then sequentially reduce them, measure them, carbonize them, measure them in biodiversity ways, broaden your metrics and say, okay, we can reduce this per unit sold. So, for example, if you make clothing, then you've got an environmental impact for a pair of trousers or a jacket. That is, we'll call that, I don't know, we'll just make, I'll make a figure up off the top of my head, we'll call it 40 yep. kil kilograms, right? Over two years, 20 kilograms a year. If we make the trousers last four years, then that's actually 10 kilograms a year. You've managed to halve the environmental impact per unit of utility. Yep. But they're probably going to now be better trousers or jackets, so you're going to have to charge more money for them. Okay, that's a real challenge, but you're going to have to do it. How do we do it in a way that is fair and equitable? Well, actually, we turn it into a lease or a service or we finance it in some way. The poor already pay more for their goods. If I want a pair of artisan denim jeans like the ones I'm wearing, I can get them from three or four amazing producers in the UK. And I'm going to be paying about 160 to 200 pounds a pair and they will be guaranteed for life. I just send them back to Walthamstow, they get fixed, send them back to Brighton they get fixed. So I already can buy amazing jeans and they're for life. If I don't have 160 mm. pounds, I've only got, I don't know, 80 quid or 50 quid. I can go online and I can buy a pair of jeans, but I can't necessarily buy good jeans. So I go to a, a catalog and I find my jeans in there, which are already 30% dearer than they are on the high street and I can't afford them. So I tick the box that says pay weekly and you can spell weekly yeah. in two ways. So I tick that box so my 50 G pound jeans are now 80 pounds because they're in there, but now I can't afford to buy them. So I'm paying 29.9% interest over four years. Over that period, I'll have paid the same as if I bought the really expensive jeans, which will last me till I die. So the poor already pay more. So how do we reduce environmental impact? We can elongate life. If we do that, we need a revolution in business models. That's what we're waiting for. And it's beginning to happen. And sadly, we're hitting the recession now, maybe. So that needs to be factored into the way that we grow our businesses. It should be good for everybody, not just good for the wealthy. And I find that utterly fascinating. So measure your environmental impact, mm. set targets to reduce that impact, employ people who believe what you believe, attract customers with a really clear why, because you'll attract the ones that you that will sell your product for you. Your customers will say how great you are. I think there's a really nice piece of research done by a guy called Mark Schaefer in his book, Marketing Rebellion. And it says, you are not what you say you are. You are what we say you are. So you're looking for customers that want to do that and that really get it. And don't get hung up on totems. 
don't rush towards. So I did this piece of TV with Hugh Fernley Whittenstall a few years ago on coffee cups, that big expose on coffee cups. That was me and Hugh sat in a bar talking about coffee cups. And, and Hugh was talking about how bad they were in terms of recyclability and they were, and there were some fibs written on the side of those coffee cups. And, uh, and we did a piece and it went massive and it was amazing. And when we finished, I said, hey, Hugh, do you know what the carbon impact of a cup is? And he said, no, I don't. And I said, the carbon impact of a cup is about 30 grams of carbon. He said, is that good? Is that bad? I said, it just is. That's what it is. So 30 yeah. grams every time you throw it away. I said, do you know what the carbon impact of a latte is? And he said, no. And I said, that's about 300 grams of carbon. So, so if you leave, leave 10% of your latte, you might as well have thrown another cup away. If you get the grande or the, I don't even know what the words they use these days, a bucket of coffee. Yeah, the Starbucks stuff. Yeah. Bon bonkers, <laughs> right? Just give me large. Then, and you leave half, which you could easily do because it's so huge. You've thrown away probably in the region of 180 grams of carbon. And she was like, wow, that's amazing. So why is that? Is that the boiling water? Is it the shipping of the coffee? I said, no, it's the milk. It's the dairy. It's got such a huge carbon footprint. If you look at normal coffee, hot water, 90 grams versus 300 grams. The totem is the cup. Actually, in reality, let's sell smaller coffees. Let's sell smaller coffees mm. in situ. You don't need the cup. You've got half the carbon impact of the total drink. You've got much less waste. You look at all the bins around coffee shops. They're leaking coffee at the bottom because we've made too much of it. So the whole thing is totemic rather than based on science. And that's what you're concentrating on your book. Yeah. On this idea of the at the start of this podcast, you listed the start of your journey of your career. It's like a full circle, isn't it, to write this book? It really is. You were persuading people. And now this book is really where you've created your agency. And here is a book that's bringing all of this insight into one place. Have you enjoyed writing it? Yeah, I've not finished it yet. I'm still going. I have. I've really enjoyed writing it because it is distilling down all of those 32 years of business practice, adding some science to the art. Everyone has an opinion. We've lost the experts in sustainability. We've got lots of people saying lots of things and they don't really know what they're talking about. I did a talk recently in, in Cornwall about why this is the best time to be alive. And I touch on this whole issue of sustainability in there. And I mentioned an experiment by a guy called Carl Mobius, it's called the Pike Syndrome. And I'm in a room full of people who are environmental experts, one of which is one of, the, one of the biggest environmental podcasters at the moment. And I said, and you all know Carl Mobius. And everyone went, in fact, no one put their hand up. And I went, but you're all supposed to know stuff. Like you're all supposed to know this. And they don't. And sadly, sometimes opinion has trumped science. And all I want to do is redress the balance mm. a little bit and then give businesses a really simple set of stepping stones through this so that they can build a business that they're proud of rather than one that does harm. Gosh, Mark, I could talk to you all day. I think everyone should talk to you all day. And you might not like that, but it's a wealth of knowledge. And I cannot wait to read your book. It's exactly what is needed. And I just, yes, it's you're the past and the future all coming together in a way that we can understand. And I feel really empowered talking to you. At the end of this interview, Mark, we come to the point where I talk about the journey being like a roller coaster and we've got our highs and lows. And I was wondering what you would say has been, if you were on your roller coaster of your career and your life, what has been one of your biggest lows? Oh, that's really easy. About, must be about 12 years ago. We got a camper van and we'd started going on a holiday in the UK up in Northumberland. And we do a week there, which is one of my favorite parts of the world. I love it. And then we drive down to Margate and we'd have a holiday there. And we were really lucky. We were blessed with golden weather for the first three or four years. And I watched Margate grow from, what's the word, run downtown to an amazing, the amazing place that it is. And each, each year I should buy here, had no money, so didn't buy here. And there was one year when we were blessed with great weather, Holly. We were camping just down the road at Birchington on Sea and the rains came down and they came down and they came down and the awning next to the camper van had a foot of standing water in it and it was miserable and the kids were in tears. I was really frustrated with it. So we went and got an Airbnb. We cleaned our bank account out. We went and got an Airbnb in Margate and then we went to the cinema 
Now, I could have afforded my ticket, but I didn't. I paid for the kids' tickets and my wife's ticket. And I sat in a camper van in the rain crying, thinking, how has this happened? I've been doing this for ages. How is it? Why has it gone so bad? I thought, okay, who do I need to work for? Who, who would be my, my list of clients? I really, my aspirational list. And I made all the lists, the Patagonias, the Nikes, the Covers. I, I made this amazing list method. And I'm thinking, brilliant. None of them need me. Then none of those people need me. So I came up with a counter list of the people that really needed me. And I went away and I chipped away at them and I got them all. And then the work I was doing with them was so well rated, regarded, that I got all of the good list as well. So I got the phone calls from Patagonia, from Nike. And all of a sudden, the work I'd done was shining brightly. But that moment in that van, in tears, in the rain, with my family in the cinema and me thinking, I couldn't afford, I could afford the ticket. But I'm sat outside feeling really sorry for myself. That was the lowest. And why did you feel sorry for yourself? Because life had moved on and the camper van had moved into an Airbnb and the playing cards had become a cinema trip. Because I, I couldn't afford a proper holiday for my kids. Simple as and the can yeah. now and life's great. And I could before. It was just this period that was really difficult. And, yeah. and it was that moment where I just thought, okay, I, it can't get, I, we ha, I have nothing. I have no money. And it cannot get any more difficult than this. And it brought with it its own mental health challenges. And that was, the, yeah. that was the low point. That was the low point. That was your low. And conversely, your high, your greatest high on that roller coaster. You know what? I'd forgotten you were going to ask these questions. So I can't remember. It's not, it, there isn't no, one. That, that but is... I would say that your, your low of crying to writing the list of who you dreamt of, to then creating the next list, to then that actually making your first list call you. Yeah. Patagonia and Nike calling you. I don't know, but that's that it's is amazing. an amazing story. That's an amazing high. It is, and it's about projection, isn't it? And you can get, I can get quite woo woo about this, but it's about the positive affirmations. And go on, go just grace. go on to give me one minute of woo woo. So I firmly believe that if you want to be it, you've got to see it. If you can imagine it happening, it will happen. If you can't imagine it happening, you won't try and get it. These constraining beliefs we set ourselves are so so important. So that was a high when they all came back. Being in New York in 2019 for my daughter's wedding, she wanted to get married. We were on holiday in New York. So last minute, I'm going to get married in New York. My granddaughter was there. My son was there. All three of my daughters were there. My son-in-law was there. There's an amazing photograph in Central Park. We all look brilliant. I was wearing a pink tuxedo. My wife's wearing this amazing gold oh, wow. A-line dress. The kids were all in funky clothes. And we got a woman who was just passing us by to take a photograph and it is radiant. That's the high. Oh, God, could I love you more? <laughs> I'll send you a photograph. That's great. Will you send I, Everyone's going to want to see it, will you? Yeah, that would be wonderful. It's brought real tears to my eyes. What a beautiful, never had anyone just say something just so clearly beautiful and personal as their moment. Mark, you've got my cogs of the brain turning. Uh, yeah, definitely. I feel like I've got some power in my hands to drive positive change. But you already do. Thank you, Mark. I, thank you. But I feel even more determined. And I really hope everyone listening feels determined as well. This is, though, the part of the podcast where I hand over to you to read a letter to your younger self. And I always say I've never, I've, I don't hear these letters before. And it's just, I'm so blessed and thankful that you would take the time to write it to us all, Mark. And I hand over to you. Thank you. And this was terrifying. I get people to do this on my fear of moving on workshops. <laughs> and I sit there while everyone <laughs> okay. writes. Everyone's in tears. And I'm sat there thinking, oh, I wonder what I'm going to make for tea tonight. So I put it off, Holly, to this morning. I thought you might. It's all right. I love it. Um, I'll read it, right? So, dear Mark. Yeah, it's just Mark. Sometimes Shayla. No nickname. And what's worse, although your parents said Mark was an unusual name when they had you in Australia in 1968, they lied. It was the third most popular name in Australia that year and the fourth most popular name in the UK that year. So you can't use your name to stand out. You're going to have to use your actions. Anyway, this is a letter from the future. It's nice here. You'll like it. And I want to offer some advice and some reassurance. And I know you'll listen. You've always been looking for this. 
Reassurance. You know when you can't focus and you can feel your mind spinning like a cake mix in the Robo Chef. That's not a weakness. It's not blending everything together to make a soup. It's a gift and it allows you to see across ideas and make connections that other people can't make. It's the intersections between things that make for interest. And you're all intersection. You will have your grandparents for a long time, honor them, apart from one. You won't have him for much longer. So spend a bit more time with him. Dig the garden, make ginger beer, go for walks with him, spend time in the shed making stuff, and in his greenhouse splicing fuchsias. Hold his hand more. You're much more alike than you realize. Fight your corner. Your two overt bullying at work incidents due to come. And you've also got one ghosting incident. None of these were about you. They're about them. You make people feel uncomfortable, feel less in comparison, and you shine in ways that they can't. Rather than polish themselves, they'd rather dull your shine. As you rise, as you change and grow, some people will fall away from you. This is because they liked you as you were, smaller, less visible, timid. Your job is to keep growing and to keep going. Fight your corner too. You will be taken advantage of a number of times everybody does. At work, in life, generally, people will see your friendliness as a weakness. It isn't. Keep being like that. But if you suspect someone is being a bit shit, give them the benefit of doubt once. Then protect or remove yourself. However, there are stories and lessons from being broken. Remember, they are bruises, not tattoos, Shayla. Although you'll really like tattoos when you hit 50 and it is an addiction. Movement. It defines you. Let it. Keep moving. It helps your brain and your soul. Although you're really good at it, rugby isn't your sport. When you stop, you'll realize it's played by some right arseholes. Run, Shayla, run. And there's this thing called swimming. It's magic. Water is your element. You just need the right coach. He's waiting in a little tank called Swaddling Coat. Start yoga earlier. It's magic. It will open up the bits that need opening up mentally, emotionally, and physically, and strengthen the bits that need strengthening. One day, you will meet someone that turns your head and heart upside down. And will continue to do that for 31 years and still does. You will grow together. You will heal together. Splice like two fuchsias in your granddad's greenhouse. Each strengthening the other. She's not your best friend. She is your lover, your muse, and your equal. In your darkest moments, you will have many. Know that nothing lasts forever and that light is coming. Kids and grandkid, and many more to come. You will be so proud. Your job is to lift them higher, not slow them down. Be open and honest. Don't worry you were. Celebrate their magic and joy. You can't live their lives for them, even when it gets hard. Identity. You are not what you do. You do not need to seek reflected light from others. You are the way you make people feel about themselves and about life. There's some boring shit. There's a company called Apple. They look like a lame duck right now, but buy some shares as soon as you can. And when that bloke offers you the house in Clerkenwell for £52,000, this will be just before you marry in 1991, just find any way you can of scraping that deposit together. And keep running. Never away, because there's no such place. Run just because you can. All my love. Well, that was beautiful. <laughs> Set me off twice. What a beautiful... <laughs> what a beautiful letter. Just, you have this wonderful way of bringing the two sides, the science and the creativity and humour and soulfulness and you're this complete package of just real beauty and I'm so glad that you're around and I'm so glad that you're helping people and I'm so glad that at 54 you're still going and by the way it's not old. I'm hoping you're going to be doing this at 74 as well. Mark it's just been an honour an absolute honour and I think you've inspired so many people with your beautiful words and your humour today. So thank you. No, thank you. And thank you for everything that you've done. You've trailblazed. You've been a voice for those people that didn't know they needed one. And you've pulled together a movement that is way bigger than you. And I don't think even you knew that when you started. So it's been wonderful to witness and to continue to witness the changes that you're going through and that you'll make and do amazing things after this. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.